Hello, and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Martin. And uh, as you can see on my title slide, I should have a co-presenter, uh, Jolt, uh, who unfortunately couldn't travel uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances. So he canceled last minute. And um, he was my engineering counterpart. Uh, I'm a product manager at Cisco. So um, I'm basically left without his, uh, without his deep engineering knowledge. Uh, so if you're in here for that, I will try to make my best impressions. Uh, even do a small demo, uh, but it won't be live uh, as uh, I didn't have the time to properly uh, prepare for that. But uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to substitute uh, my colleague, Scholt. Uh The title of this presentation is uh, Leveraging the Linux Kernel for Building a Zero Trust Environment Without a Service Mesh. And uh, to be honest, I don't like this title. I think it's too buzzwordy. Uh, if you see zero trust, uh, you see zero trust everywhere uh, today. Everyone is talking about it. Uh, everyone knows that uh, it is somewhat of a marketing buzzword. Um, you hear service mesh a lot, especially at conferences like this. And uh, you also hear Linux kernel a lot, especially in the context of uh, eBPF. So you're probably thinking this will be something about eBPF, uh, this will be something about MTLS and, uh, and uh, packaged in this uh, zero trust buzzword. Uh, you're somewhat right, but uh, it is not eBPF. Uh, you'll see why. Uh, so let me uh, start by trying to explain this title. Uh, first, uh, let me talk a bit about zero trust, uh, because I think most of you in this room already know what is it uh, or heard about it a lot but uh, there is a lot of confusion uh, around zero trust today, what it is, uh, how to implement a zero trust strategy, and um, how does it connect to service meshes and, uh, and uh, all the other things. So in my opinion, well, it's not really my opinion, uh, zero trust really is uh, only a security principle, more like a philosophy. Uh, it is only this small thing uh, that you should never trust, but always verify anything uh, and everything uh, within your infrastructure. And this is moving from uh, an earlier model uh, that was rather trust, but still verify. So in the end, zero trust is uh, not a specification, uh, especially not an implementation, and uh, especially not one product. So if anyone wants to sell you uh, a zero trust product that will solve all your zero trust strategy, then uh, don't believe it to them because uh, it is just not possible. Uh, zero trust is really a philosophy that uh, you will uh, take into account when uh, designing your systems, uh, designing how uh, security will uh, look like in your systems. Zero trust is, uh, is a term that broad uh, that, that uh, it can even be um, implemented in uh, situations, uh, not cybersecurity, but something completely different. Like uh, I've asked ChatGPT to uh, create me a picture about the Trojan horse and uh, how it would have looked like if, um, if the Trojans have implemented a zero trust strategy. So even if uh, the horse uh, would be brought into the city walls, Maybe it uh, would be separated, it would be blocked, it would be uh, heavily guarded, and uh, soldiers couldn't just uh, infiltrate uh, the whole city, and uh, maybe history would be different today. I don't know. Um, but of course, uh, we're not here for uh, history lessons, uh, but uh, we're in the context of uh, cloud native security. So let's talk a few, few words about uh, why zero trust is still important. Uh, even, even though it's hypothetical, uh, even though it's just a philosophy, even though uh, there is marketing surrounding it, uh, it is still important. And uh, this is my somewhat simplified view of what zero trust is. If you've listened to the keynotes, uh, there was a keynote uh, from one of the guys uh, in SysDig, and he was talking about how uh, systems are getting more complicated 
uh, how we are managing more and more services, more and more applications. And uh, by creating more and more applications, we are creating um, even more network connections between these applications. Uh, the old parameter-based uh, security model is uh, not good enough today because, uh, well, because of two reasons. One is because of uh, insider attacks. Uh, it can happen that uh, someone uh, trusted within your organization uh, will try to uh, exfiltrate your data. But even if it's not an insider, uh, a usual attack uh, looks like this today. Uh, the attacker is able to uh, do an initial breach by, I don't know, uh, stealing some credentials from a user uh, through a phishing attempt. Uh, that's probably the most common way of uh, doing an initial breach. Uh, they will get into a bastion host or something like that. And the attack doesn't stop there. Uh, they will try to uh, sit there silently, uh, discover all the other uh, networks, uh, workloads, uh, infrastructure pieces that uh, they can reach. It can even take months, uh, weeks, months, uh, until someone is able to uh, move within your network uh, laterally. Uh, one step, two steps, three steps, and in the end, uh, the actual security breach uh, or incident uh, will be uh, much more serious than uh, it looked uh, at first hand. If we go with the zero trust model of uh, never trust connections, uh, there basically won't be a difference between uh, this yellow arrow uh, right here and uh, all the orange arrows because every connection is, uh, is treated as uh, if it would be uh, external to your system. So I've talked a lot about what I think zero trust is and why is it important. Uh, let's try to bring it a bit closer uh, to uh, cloud-native security. So this is my somewhat simplified uh, product manager picture of uh, what Zero Trust is. Because I think Zero Trust comes down to uh, an access decision uh, and an enforcement. Who can access uh, any kinds of company resources? It is either humans uh, or non-humans. Uh, non-humans uh, usually workloads, applications, trying to uh, access other applications. And uh, zero trust means that I need to provide an encrypted secure channel uh, for all of these uh, connections, all of these uh, resource accesses. And uh, I have to decide if those actors, uh, either humans or non-humans, uh, can access to that resource, and if yes, then I can uh, admit access. If not, then I will have to deny. Uh, when I, I'm talking about humans and non-humans, um, I also talk about their identities. Um, again, at uh, one of the keynotes by Lin Sun, uh, she was talking about uh, human identities. She compared it to passports. Um, and talking about workload identities uh, as certificates. And I think that's a good analogy uh, because uh, users, humans, uh, have identities. I have an identity. Uh, you all have identities. And those identities are somehow mapped to uh, credentials or uh, company access uh, through some kind of um, um, systems. For workloads, it is a bit uh, more different. Uh, but we somehow need to uh, give a workload uh, identity. Instead of just uh, doing uh, access management with credentials everywhere, uh, we should aim at uh, really providing an identity for your workloads. Because uh, if you have an identity for that workload, it is not as easy to steal as uh, like some easy uh, secret keys uh, or whatever uh, you were trying to use. Access decision uh, is probably not a one-step process. It is not a central uh, piece in your architecture that is uh, doing access decision because it can come from a lot of different places, um, most simply from access policies. Uh, it can be a service mesh. It can be something else. But somewhere you will need to describe what workloads can reach other workloads or what services. 
And uh, that's just the first step because you have a bunch of other security tools, um, hopefully, uh, in your system that can uh, affect this access decision, like network security. Uh, let's say uh, someone is trying to access uh, a resource from uh, an untrusted uh, source or uh, behavior analysis, like uh, your user uh, has uh, a behavior pattern and uh, now what they are trying to do uh, is, um, is uh, not like that. Or device security posture. I, uh, I don't know how many of you have faced uh, the difficulty when uh, you're trying to access some company resource and your uh, mobile phone is saying your MFA application is outdated and you will need to update it. Uh, because if that's not updated, then uh, even though you have uh, access normally, uh, it will be affected. Or threat intelligence as well. And maybe I have a few other things uh, that I haven't listed here. Uh, it isn't supposed to be a very complete picture of, uh, of what Zero Trust is, but uh, this is basically uh, what's in my mind about uh, Zero Trust. And uh, I said it is really hard to create one product that is, uh, cover, that is covering all aspects of Zero Trust. Uh, what we did, and what I will be talking about soon, is uh, covering only a few uh, of these items here. We are not dealing with human identities. Uh, that's a completely different uh, ball game. Uh, when you hear uh, solutions like ZTNA solutions, Zero Trust Network Access solutions, uh, I don't know, from Cloudflare maybe, that is uh, dealing with user identity and, uh, and Zero Trust for humans. We are not dealing with that. We are dealing with uh, workload identities. Uh, we are dealing with access policies, uh, but we do not cover all the other things that can affect access decisions. And we cover access decisions and enforcement uh, to some degree, uh, because as I've mentioned, it is not one central component, but our solution is doing some kind of decision and enforcement. And we are also providing an encrypted channel uh, for uh, workload communication. Uh, and basically, this is what we cover uh, from uh, all these zero trust things that I've listed here. So enough about Zero Trust. Uh, let's move on to the second part of my title. And uh, it is about without a service mesh. We are building a Zero Trust environment without a service mesh. Uh, if you're here at this conference, uh, you've probably heard a lot about service meshes. I've heard a lot about service meshes as well as I was working uh, on a service mesh product a few years ago. Um, and. Uh, Service mesh is trying to, or well, service mesh companies are trying to uh, sell you uh, zero trust uh, of some kind. Uh, if you uh, open any of the landing pages of uh, Solo.io or uh, Linkerd or whatever, uh, I'm pretty sure that you will uh, read zero trust a lot. Uh, so how does it cover zero trust? Well, with MTLS. Uh, uh, they are setting up mutual TLS connections between uh, specific workloads. Uh, but is it a complete zero trust implementation? Well, absolutely no. Uh, as I have uh, mentioned in the beginning, it uh, cannot be uh, a complete implementation. Uh, but does it cover the highlighted boxes uh, above? So uh, non-human identities, access policies, access issues, access decision, encrypted channel? Um, the answer to that is uh, mostly yes, with a few caveats. Uh, I will be talking about those uh, soon. Um, because we still have a few problems with service meshes. They are much better uh, than if you would uh, want to um, implement it on your own. Uh, you could see at uh, the keynote how hard it is to modify all your, all your applications, uh, include that specific code that handles MTLS connections, and not only that, but also the distribution of certificates, uh, having a certificate authority, uh, sign those certificates, and so on and so on. It is a very complicated process manually, and uh, service meshes are doing a good job of solving this problem, but uh, they also come with a few problems as well. Uh, first, 
they only work realistically on Kubernetes. And uh, while we are at a cloud native conference, uh, if uh, you're out in the real world, you will know that uh, there are only a few companies uh, that could uh, transfer all their workloads, uh, leg legacy workloads, uh, to Kubernetes. And most of uh, the real world companies uh, still have uh, a lot of tools running on simple VMs, uh, bare metal, uh, and uh, other places that are not Kubernetes. If you stick with a service mesh, uh, you will need to deal with this, and you will need to find a different implementation for all the other places that are outside of Kubernetes. Second, uh, everyone is talking about sidecarless service meshes today. Uh, Istio is coming up with Ambient. But uh, the reality is that they still involve uh, a lot of proxies, uh, even though those are not sidecars, uh, but node-level proxies, uh, they are still uh, proxies. Uh, it still uh, gets you some complexity uh, because network traffic uh, needs to be routed to these proxies or through these proxies. Uh, they will consume resources, and uh, especially in a large cluster if you've uh, if uh, you've implemented a service mesh before, you will know that uh, it can really take up resources, even if uh, they don't add too much latency, but uh, they do add uh, uh, considerable uh, resource usage. Um, it also means that uh, if you're running a service mesh, you will trust everything that is running behind the proxies. Uh, because uh, MTLS uh, is really implemented uh, between those two different uh, proxies, uh, not between uh, your uh, specific processes, and uh, it can be a problem. Not necessarily a problem in, uh, in everywhere, but uh, it can still be a problem. Also, proper certificate management is hard. Uh, if uh, you just install Istio, for example, uh, it will come uh, and work out of the box uh, with uh, self-signed certificates, but if you want to uh, plug in your uh, company uh, certificate authority, then uh, it won't be easy. Not to talk about how uh, hard it is to uh, deploy, manage all these proxies, and uh, especially debug uh, if something goes wrong. But more importantly, uh, in my opinion, what always uh, came up when uh, I was working with service meshes is a service mesh uh, mixes responsibilities between networking and security teams because they do not only solve uh, these zero trust issues, but they also deal with other problems like routing traffic um, and uh, creating an overlay network maybe uh, or just modifying IP tables, uh, whatever. Uh, but it means that uh, you will need to involve your uh, network or infrastructure infrastructure teams uh, to deal with the service mesh. And in a lot of cases, especially if you saw those uh, service uh, created by uh, CNCF, uh, MTLS and security always comes up as top priority when someone is, uh, it wants to implement a service mesh. Uh, it is often the case, and I saw it a lot, that, uh, uh, that companies were trying to adopt a service mesh just because of MTLS. They didn't need all the uh, monitoring all the traffic routing capabilities, but they wanted uh, out-of-the-box MTLS, and just because of that, they had to, uh, to deploy a service mesh and uh, deal with uh, all the proxy complexity. So we wanted to find a different way of, uh, of doing this, um, basically something very similar to what a service mesh is doing with mutual TLS, uh, but without proxies and uh, like really simply, without uh, implementing a service mesh again. We didn't want to deal with all the network routing uh, and other functionalities that a service mesh can provide. We only wanted to uh, do mutual TLS automatically uh, between two different workloads. And we found our solution uh, in the Linux kernel, uh, not with eBPF, uh, but by uh, writing uh, a standard Linux kernel model. I will be talking about uh, the why. The why. <clears throat> but first, let's see what happens uh, between two workloads uh, when tr they are trying to establish a TCP connection. Again, this is uh, a simplified 
way of, uh, of drawing things. Um, I'm a big fan of simpli simplicity. So excuse me if uh, someone is really into that. And uh, I know the intricate details that are happening in kernel space about all the uh, different system calls and uh, network bindings and uh, all the other things that are happening. But uh, for our case, what's uh, more important is uh, that if you're writing an application, let's say a standard uh, server uh, in Go, you will use some kind of application library uh, that will uh, listen on a port. Uh, you won't even need to think about what's happening uh, behind. But what's happening behind is uh, it will open a socket and uh, it will uh, listen and accept connections on that socket. On the client side, uh, a, another socket will be opened and uh, the client will uh, open the connection uh, to the other socket. The kernel, the Linux kernel, uh, gives you a good way of uh, intercepting these system calls. So when there is uh, a socket call or a connection open call, then uh, you can write some custom uh, Linux kernel code that uh, intercepts these calls and uh, somehow uh, extends the functionality uh, of that network connection. And this is basically what we did. Uh, we've created uh, a driver, a Linux kernel model. We call this project Camblet, so that's why it's, uh, it's a Camblet driver. And that uh, driver is uh, able to do a few different things. It is able to intercept uh, these system calls and is able to uh, issue an X509 certificate uh, to that specific well, basically socket. Um, I usually say process uh, because uh, usually how we use it is uh, we bind these certificates to processes. As you can see, it's not a proxy. Uh, that identity uh, will be uh, assigned to that specific process uh, within kernel space. That certificate uh, will have a spiffy ID that is uh, basically uh, the identity um, of uh, that specific process. Uh, so we didn't want to re reinvent the wheel and uh, wanted to go with uh, well-known uh, CNCF projects. Uh, so that certificate will have that spiffy ID uh, where it will uh, identify that specific workload. And uh, this driver will also be used to uh, manage the whole mutual TLS handshake uh, between the two different workloads. Uh, and this is basically the reason that we are not using eBPF, because uh, eBPF is really a restricted environment, and uh, doing something like a full MTLS handshake would be, I would say, impossible uh, within eBPF today. Um, if it will evolve, then maybe we will uh, move on and, uh, and move this project to eBPF. But for now, uh, it doesn't give us the flexibility that uh, we need today. But because uh, the MTLS handshake happens in kernel space, it also means that uh, private keys that we use don't even have to leave kernel space. <coughs> uh, it also means that unencrypted traffic will never leave kernel space. There are no proxies involved where traffic will be routed. Uh, everything will be uh, encrypted and uh, we will offload that uh, TLS uh, connection to KTLS, that is standard kernel TLS, and it also means that uh, even if something does not have the Camblet driver installed, but uh, they will use uh, standard uh, TLS primitives, they will be able to uh, talk with uh, a workload that is uh, using Camblet as a driver. We also, use pol we also do policy enforcement uh, in kernel space uh, because, yeah, we can do that if we intercept uh, the calls uh, and somehow we have a pro policy written down somewhere, uh, we are able to utilize that policy and say, I don't want to allow this connection to happen. 
this is not all, uh, because we also needed a user space component. The reason for that is we can't handle everything from, from kernel space, uh, especially things like, uh, like handling policies. Uh, if, you, if you're a user of this model and uh, you write policies, then uh, you will need to write those policies uh, somewhere in user space, put it in a file, uh, have someone or have something read it and uh, push it down into kernel space. Uh, and then the driver can do the actual uh, access enforcement. Uh, but you need something that is able to interpret those policies. And, it, and this uh, user space agent uh, is doing a few other things as well. It is doing um, CSR, CSR signing. It means that uh, in kernel space, uh, when we intercept a call, we create uh, not a full certificate, but rather um, a CSR, <coughs> a certificate signing request uh, that we uh, push to the uh, agent in user space. And then either that agent uh, signs it, uh, if it's a self-signed something, or it can uh, forward it to some kind of central authority uh, that can do that signing for you and uh, push it back to uh, the user space agent and uh, then back to uh, the Kemper driver. Um, we are also doing uh, metadata collection uh, in these Kemplet agents because uh, in the kernel, you have kernel level primitives, of course. You know about all the uh, process IDs, IP addresses, uh, ports, and so on and so on. But you uh, don't really have like Kubernetes metadata, for example. And uh, when you're writing a policy, uh, you probably don't want to deal with uh, process IDs all the time, but you want to deal with uh, Kubernetes labels, uh, names, and so on. Um, this agent is able to collect all this metadata, like from Kubernetes or from uh, other uh, services as well, and uh, then translate that metadata uh, to the Kemplet driver to do the actual enforcement. Uh, but still, even though we are running a user agent or a user space agent, uh, Kemlet will still be um, like invisible uh, to actual application developers. So they won't need to change their code, they won't need to rebuild their applications, they don't even need to uh, restart it. Of course, if we have an agent, uh, we can have a control plane as well. Um, it says later because uh, we haven't implemented the control plane yet. Uh, so if you want to, want to try this out, uh, you will have to do the actual like policy distribution uh, manually. Uh, it is planned. Uh, we don't know uh, when and how exactly. But uh, in theory, uh, of course, uh, we would have a control plane uh, that will interact with users uh, that can write policies, and that control plane will uh, distribute those policies to the actual agents. Uh, it will also handle uh, service discovery. I won't go into details here, but somehow we will need to know uh, which services are part of uh, this whole uh, system. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel again, so we want to uh, connect to existing service discovery methods. And of course, uh, that control plane could sign certificates as well and uh, act as a certificate authority. In the end, what you will get is this. Uh, so even though someone is able to start a malicious process uh, within your node, within your trusted node, uh, when they want to open a connection to workload B, uh, they will need to open a socket. And uh, if that socket is not, authori not authorized uh, in kernel space by our driver, uh, the connection won't happen. Uh, it is not true for service meshes, for example, and uh, it can really be a powerful thing because even if an attacker has access to one of your machines, one of your workloads, and is able to start malware on that uh, node, uh, even though that node is trusted, if uh, that specific malware is not whitelisted uh, in our policies, and it won't be whitelisted, of course, then uh, the connection won't happen. So just to summarize, uh, the benefits of this approach is that uh, there are zero proxies involved. 
uh, we won't have to uh, redirect traffic. Um, we won't have to modify IP tables. Uh, we don't do anything with, uh, with the network layer. If something is able to, or one workload is able to reach uh, another workload, then uh, it will work. Identities are process-based. Uh, as I have mentioned on the previous slide, if uh, your policies are not allowing a different process, then uh, even from a trusted environment, you won't be access uh, another workload. MTLS happens in kernel space completely from the handshake to the actual uh, TLS connection. It works everywhere with the Linux OS, uh, so it doesn't need Kubernetes. Uh, if you run Kubernetes, uh, you can use Kubernetes primitives, you can use Kubernetes metadata, uh, but if not, then uh, you can rely on process IDs, uh, VMs, uh, or standard IP addresses. Uh, it provides access control and also encryption, and uh, it is application and uh, network agnostic. Uh, you don't have to uh, write code in your applications. You don't have to rebuild it, uh, restart it, and uh, yeah, again, uh, you don't have to deal with uh, the network layer. So, uh, a quick demo. Uh, maybe it is uh, too small. I don't know if I can. Can you see it? Uh, from behind. Okay. So this uh, demo is uh, pre-recorded. I don't know if it. Mm. Okay, it has started. It is a very simple demo. Uh, I have two VMs here. Uh, both of these VMs are running locally in uh, Lima. Uh, one of these is uh, an Nginx server. Uh, the second is uh, a curl container. Uh, the Nginx server is not running in Kubernetes. It is uh, running on top of this uh, VM. But the curl container is running in Kubernetes uh, on the other VM um, in a pod. Uh, it is an Alpine pod, uh, a very simple Alpine pod. Uh, we will use that Alpine pod to uh, start a curl and uh, try to access Nginx. Camlet uh, is already installed on these uh, VMs, uh, but it is uh, not enabled yet. Um, you can uh, see it with the mod info uh, command uh, that it is not enabled yet uh, or that it is running. Uh, <clears throat> and what we'll do is uh, We'll start ngrep, and uh, we'll listen to uh, the connections uh, happening on port 80. And uh, we'll exec into that Alpine container and uh, run curl. Uh, as expected, we got an answer. Uh, Nginx responded. And uh, if you look into the ngrep logs, uh, you will see that uh, the, uh, the response is there. And uh, it is not encrypted, it is plain text, uh, and uh, we could read it. Now we can enable Camblet uh, by uh, calling, uh, uh, by starting the service. Uh, and uh, by enabling Camblet on uh, both of the VMs, uh, we'll do the same uh, curl command again. Uh, but first, uh, we should create uh, a policy because it will only work if uh, we write a policy. So uh, we have a command uh, that can help you generate a policy, uh, basically a scaffold. Then uh, you can, of course, uh, rewrite it. Uh, we'll give it uh, the process ID on this VM uh, and uh, we'll uh, give, uh, give it a name. Uh, now it is Nginx. Uh, the related uh, policy is very simple. Uh, it has a few selectors. Um, yeah, we've somewhat modified it. Uh, it has a few selectors. Uh, that is uh, basically the process name and the destination port and uh, the binary pass. Uh, this will be the process uh, where the identity uh, will be bound. Uh, the workload ID will be Nginx. Uh, this is what will uh, appear in uh, the spiffy ID uh, generated for the certificate. And uh, we've also added uh, 
this thing, MTLS uh, strict, so it will uh, only allow connections if they go through MTLS. And uh, allowed spiffy IDs means that uh, it will only allow connections if uh, they come from uh, this specific uh, identity. If uh, it, uh, I don't know if it's easier to uh, create a live demo or uh, talk uh, through an existing video uh, because uh, timing it is hard. <laughs> Uh, but what should happen is, uh, again, we should uh, go into uh, the other container and, uh, again, uh, yeah, see uh, the policy on the other side as well. Uh, it is very similar, but as you can see, it contains uh, Kubernetes uh, selectors uh, in the metadata, so you don't have to deal with uh, process IDs uh, in this part. We will again uh, call ngrep and see what happens uh, in the connection. And uh, then we will cur call uh, the curl command again. Uh, we haven't restarted uh, the Alpine container. We haven't restarted uh, the Nginx uh, server either. And uh, now that uh, we've called curl, uh, in ngrep uh, we can see that uh, this is now not a plain text call, but uh, it is encrypted. Uh, Camblet is uh, the name of, um, um, of um, that uh, connection. And uh, like these are uh, client hellos and server hellos. Um, and uh, now uh, this is happening uh, through MTLS. This was uh, basically my very short demo. And I finish by saying uh, Camlet is open source. So if you're interested, uh, you can learn more at camlet.io or uh, on GitHub. Uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, open an issue. Uh, we appreciate if uh, you try it out and, uh, and learn more about it. And uh, thank you. I think my time is already up and uh, I'm accepting questions. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I would have to rely. I would have to rely on Jolt if uh, he would be here. Uh, I think we're doing something similar, uh, Aspire, but um, to be honest, I can't answer this question. Um, uh, but feel free to reach out and, uh, and I, uh, yeah, I think uh, that concern is valid. <laughs> and uh, this should be on our long-term roadmap, yes. But uh, to be honest, we, we haven't discussed it yet. Um, for now, this is uh, mostly a research project and uh, we're experimenting with it. Uh, if it, uh, if it evolves, then uh, sure we'll have to uh, we'll have to take that pass. Other questions? No. Okay. Then uh, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs>